Hello, and thank you, everybody. Um, and welcome to our January webinar on the PFMP and the PGMP, something we call Beyond PMP. My name is Dr. T. Wu, and I'll be your presenter today. Throughout today, we'll talk about why PFMP, PGMP are of particular interest um, and to the project management professionals. Again, my name is Dr. T. Wu, and I'm the CEO of PMO Advisory. Um, I actually wear multiple hats. I'm also a full-time professor at Montclair State University, a visiting professor at China Europe International Business School. And I still lead um, some fairly large projects for my clients in the company. So I get pretty busy. Um, in my spare time, I do volunteer quite a bit with global organizations in the United States, such as Project Management Institute, uh, as well as on International Standard Committee. I'm a U.S. representative, for example, on one of the work groups, working groups. I myself have the background with in PMP, PGMP, PFMP, and risk management, RMP. Uh, I largely view myself as a bridge. I try to connect the dots between the world of practice, in which my last corporate job, for example, was the head of global project services for one of the big four audit tax and accounting firm, um, to really the world of academia, the training, the career development side. Uh, I've been a college professor since 2003. I trained PMO advisory, trained hundreds of professionals, especially in program portfolio management space. And in addition to that, I speak, I write multiple books, some of which you'll see. This presentation uh, is usually given by myself and my colleague, Ms. Charmaine Tellis, who does, we rotate every other month. So you may come across her in one of the other presentations. She's also a trainer. She herself is certified in portfolio and program management, as well as in project management. So you'll see her as one of our trainers. We have a couple of PFMP and PGMP trainers in addition to Ms. Tellis and myself. Um, so you may come across people like Brian Williamson or Michael Terrell. Um, I think as a company, we have really deep bench strength in this area that we call Beyond PMP. So and here are some of my recent publications that I helped or contributed in some fashion. I was on the standard committee, for example, for portfolio management, risk management, small task team for this Q&A book, um, and the task group for the, sort of, um, the CAPM certification. Uh, even right now as we speak, I'm on the review team for Pinbox 7, uh, as well as something else with PMI. So again, fairly active in this field. What do we plan to cover today? Well, there are really five main topics. One is making a very objective case why project professional should consider moving beyond just the PMP. Um, the second is a question that I get a lot, which one's better for me? Um, program portfolio management, and we'll try to address that here. Three, do a side-by-side -side comparison analysis of PGMP versus PFMP, and you may find which one's more appropriate for you. Finally, what are some of the challenges and pitfalls in terms of preparation for the exam and the application? We'll end the webinar a little bit self-serving, but presenting what PMO advisor, what my company has to offer in this space. So let's look at making an objective case. Um, and it's really based on four major points. The first is that the pace of change in our society is increasing. And we project professionals are playing catch up. Uh, we know, I think most of you know, that the success rate of projects aren't that great. And we waste a lot of money. So what we can do to help improve this field, improve our profession, and really improve ourselves is going to be that much value add. Second is related to that is project program and portfolio by association as a vehicle for change are really gaining a lot of popularity. But yet again, the results are dismal. So involving um, program and portfolio management to me is really a good game changer, something we can do to impact this field. Bullet number three, governments are even getting to the action. So we'll look at what some of the governments from the United States to Switzerland or UK are doing. Finally, 
as endeavors themselves are getting larger, more complicated, more ambiguous, we need to strengthen and expand our skills significantly. And I think two of the areas to consider, especially as you climb sort of this corporate ladder, um, is in the program portfolio management. And I'll come back to some stories. So let's just look at the field of change, right? For example, as I'm sure everybody here intuitively knows, that it now, the cycle time for a new product to come on the market and to achieve a saturation or at least a high degree of adoption has really reduced significantly. So for example, you could see that telephone itself took somewhere around 100 years before you get to over 90%, 95% uh, adoption rate. Mobile phone in mere 15 years, maybe 18 years, already achieved 85. And this data is a little bit outdated. If we were to plot this data, I think by 2018, there were more mobile lines than landlines. Um, so roughly in 20 years, competing with the old telephone for over 100 years. Uh, you can see that in other technology field as well. Take a smartphone. Right? How many people today still have the clamshell phone? Now, there are some. I'm not saying there aren't. Actually, I kind of like the clamshell phone because they're really easy to use. But nonetheless, practically everybody, if you more than go to New York subway or New Jersey train commute, everybody, um, if not everybody, 80% of the people are glued to their smartphone. Right? So you can see the rapid adoption rate. What these adoption rate means, of course, is companies have to constantly come up with new product, better product, better software. And I'm just using technology as one example, and that is true for a vast number of fields in which the competition, the release of new products and services are quickening. And you could see that in the growth of project management profession. Um, this is what I drew out from the data set I have. I don't know how exactly accurate this curve is, but I think the gist of it is there because the gist of it is based on PMI data. Right? So you could see the steep growth of the certification PMP. And right now PMP is hovering somewhere north of 960,000, probably very fast approaching that 1 million mark. So insight number two. Projects today are becoming the primary vehicle for making change happen, and yet the results are poor. So my view on this is that we need something more than just project management to manage this endeavor. We need to think smartly. We need to work um, and use our resources more effectively. So a couple of things to show you here is one in the IT field, many of you who are on the call who are IT professional probably heard of the organization called the Standish Group. Standish Group has been doing this study around the information technology project since about 1994. And over the 25 year period, um, they have studied every single year, look at the IT project and they grouped it in three ways called a successful, challenge or failed. Successful projects are pretty straightforward. These are projects we largely agree are successful. They met the schedule, uh, met the scope, um, and the customers are pretty happy. So not very controversial, they're great projects. But you could see the rate. The rate of success project hovers right around 30%. As a matter of fact, in this five year window, there's only one year that exceeded 30%. Uh, if you go back to the data all the way to 1995 or even grow forward a little bit, again, this sort of repeats itself. Fail project. These are projects that just utterly failed. They are not even completed. So they're canceled before or terminated before they're due or ran out of money for whatever reason. So there is really not a lot of disagreement on fail project. They never finish. And you can see that number hovers right around 20%, uh, very high teens, a little bit less than 20% overall, but let's say 20% for ease. Then you have the middle, the middle 50%, uh, a little bit higher in some years. These are challenge projects. These are projects we probably see very often based on our own experience. These are projects in which we did finish, so that's a good news. The bad news is it maybe cost a lot more money than we intended, a lot more time. People may not be as happy about the results. And so if you look at and grouping challenge was failed, that also means that projects in trouble are essentially 70% of the time in the IT space. 
On the diagram on the right, um, you can see this is grouped by the size of the project. And I think quite intuitively, as the project gets larger, the success rate starts to drop tremendously, precipitously, and the failure rate um, increases as well. So what this picture tells us that is not only are 70% of the projects a challenge, when you're looking at the sort of large, at least beyond the medium size, medium large to grand projects, there's a lot and a lot of room for improvement. Studies like this are, I don't think they are scientific per se, because it's hard to control all the environmental factors, and this is a bit of academic in me. Um, but on the other hand, because they're based on fairly large, massive data sets, they at least tell a very, very good story. So while you could argue, well, mine's is 51%, not 53, or 48 or 45, they still roundabout give you the right impression. The study here um, that I'm showing on this page is based on PMI study. This is in, done in May 2016. And PMI found that for every $1 billion spent on projects, roughly 12.2% are wasted. Now, if you think about that, that's a huge number of wastes. And let me give you, put that in another perspective, another study, which I didn't put in here, compared, um, study what are, what they call the projectized, projectification of society. So what percentage of project in the economy um, are project oriented? And they study countries like West Germany and Netherlands, and they found roughly about 30%. So the study didn't apply to United States per se, but United States economy is quite remarkably similar in terms of its maturity as compared to West Germany. So let's say it's 30% for United States as well. America has a $30 trillion economy, uh, sorry, $20 trillion economy, um, and about 30% of that would be $6 trillion. So if this percentage waste is anywhere close to being real, and let's round down and say just 10%, 10% of six trillion is $600 billion. So somewhere in our United States, we waste about $600 billion a year on projects. Um, that is a sobering number because I'm sure we can imagine all the social problems we can address with $600 billion. These curves here, gives you um, uh, six factors that PMI looked at. So for example, the green line is meeting original business goals in 10. And you can see it holds pretty steady at around the low 60s. Of course, that begs the question, what happened to the other 35% of the project? Uh, I think that's a clear indication of portfolio management, uh, not at work, for example. Other factors are more tangible on a project-related basis. The, uh, Illustrative is this last one, the 15% to 16%, which are deemed failure, which if you think about it, is remarkably close to this. And these are independent studies. These are not, uh, again, um, related studies, but they do study on similar topics. So again, you could argue it's 20% or 15%, but there is a pretty high number of projects that just utterly fail. <coughs> Excuse me. Insight number three, project management certification in some sectors are just no longer good to have. These are not optional anymore. They become must-have. Um, governments, such as the United States, pass legislation, um, such as the PMIAA, Program Management Improvement Accountability Act, and that really encourages and eventually will enforce government entities to start applying project program portfolio management. And this law was passed in 2016, and government doesn't move particularly fast. So right now, it's still a lot in the strategic planning stages. But nonetheless, when they become law, you can ma imagine the influence. The state government technically isn't part of this law, for example. But if New Jersey, where I live, wanted to have a robust legislation on project program management, well, they'll likely piggyback off this. Uh, so does other municipal. So these laws has a lot of sticking power. Um, but if nothing else, even if you don't believe they will ever be executed precisely, it still show you the importance and the intent in this case of government. And it's not only the Americans, 
there are a lot of other countries that have different rules and regulation. UK, for example, has actually a couple major standards, um, somewhat conflicting in, in, in that country. Uh, Switzerland has the Hermi 5. Um, Canadians, you know, I, I was jokingly said for, I think there are more certified project professionals in Canada than practically anywhere else as a percentage of population. Um, they are really, really on top of the certification game. Now, um, this picture on the right shows me in 2018, a government agency in China, uh, it forgot the, it stands for the State Administration of Foreign Expert Affairs, invited me to speak across China, uh, three cities, I think four presentations. And this one was done in northern part of China in an automobile uh, manufacturing organization. And I remember I was preparing for to ask how many people would like to be attend at this meeting. They said, oh, a couple hundred. I'm thinking, wow, that's a lot of people. I mean, a couple hundred in the United States is a pretty sizable symposium. And lo and behold, you could see me around the front there, and you see all the people. Well, what was more impressive about the satellite, these people, there are actually about another somewhere around 2,500 people dialing via the satellite. So the room itself has about 500. Um, plus the satellites, about 3,000 people attended. And this was a presentation really mostly on risk management, but it just shows you the emphasis of the various government agencies uh, trying to place, sort of understand how to do project better. Because as PMI study shows, it really hurts the pocketbook uh, when they're not doing well. Insight number four, um, today's endeavor are just becoming bigger. Um, rise of mega projects. Right where we're not very far from where we live, we have a shopping mall that's being built. Well, it's a more of an entertainment center. And that project is approaching, actually already exceeded $5 billion and going toward the $6 billion. And it has not been fully done yet. So, you know, a billion here, a billion there, it really started sounding like real money. Um, they're also becoming more complicated. A lot of integration, bleeding edge, especially in technology space today, we have a lot of exciting areas uh, in which there are a lot of technology de development. I'm sure almost all of you are impacted somewhere by digital revolution, for example. Digitization of your workplace, of nothing else, even where you shop, because chances are the store where you go buy clothing may likely be closed because a lot more shopping is done online. So the digital revolution is taking shape. Um, they're also becoming more ambiguous um, because if you think about even just take the technology field like the data. Today we work with a lot of big data, fuzzy data, and trying to figure out what does it mean. So these are really excellent time, I think, for all of us as professionals to start thinking bigger picture, grander than just beyond the results-oriented nature of project management and look at program and portfolio management. So this is an example of plane assembly. I think this is uh, Airbus, but Airbus 7380, um, sorry, uh, the Airbus plane had somewhere around 2,000 different manufacturers that had to integrate together, right? So, and this is not just parts, these are manufacturing partners uh, in that neighborhood. What are other reasons for considering moving beyond the PMP? Well, competitive reasons. Uh, as I mentioned, there are about 960, 970,000 active PMP. And this keyword is active because PMI only tracks active. There are a lot of retired PMPs out there too. Um, recognition, promotion, job requirement. Professionally, I think you also gain a new knowledge and skill set by learning program or portfolio management. Enhanced network. Program and portfolio management put you almost immediately in a more senior role. So you have the ability to associate and also network with senior project professionals. And if you're truly interested in your organization, you can also start working yourself to become what I call the CPO, Chief Project Officer. Now, let me be very clear. I'm not saying the world is gonna have suddenly not more CPOs. Uh, I remember when I started in project management field back in the uh, late 90s. Um, and I was interested in CPO even back then. And I remember it was not particularly popular. 
Uh, today, I don't even think it's any more popular than it was back in the 90s. Of course, that raises an interesting question. If projects are becoming so popular, because late 90s, PMP probably is only ranked in hundreds, and today there's almost a million, uh, how come this role hasn't grown? Uh, I think there are many different reasons, and by the way, that's an area of my research interest, so if any of you are interested, feel free to pin me on it. But I think the role, I, I think the short answer is there are just too many C-level C roles, so I don't think there's room for CTO. Having said that, though, I do think there's a lot more senior project executives um, and various titles associated with that, so vice president of project, project services, senior vice president, uh, and even the existing C-level have a lot more project responsibilities than they had back in, say, late 90s. Uh, other reason, growth, satisfaction, gratification. Uh, one of the group of customers that comes with PMO Advisory for help often are fairly senior project professionals, their vice presidents and sometimes higher. Um, they started at a time in which the PMP wasn't that particularly uh, popular, so they never obtained that. Fast forward 20 years, practically everybody in their group now are certified, except the leader of the group, not certified. So obviously there could be a little bit hollowness there, and especially if they lost their job and need to find another job. So they come to me and ask, you know, what is a great certification? And this is where I think program portfolio management is really helpful because I don't think they want a PMP, um, not to mention, you know, the 960 pages of book you have to study in the PMBOK, but more impressively is you just then have a Me Too certification as the rest of your subordinates. Getting a PFMP, PGMP, now makes really good strategic sense for them. This is a conceptual career ladder. Um, I grew up in this space and I climbed this ladder actually pretty methodically from the step one. I remember when I graduated from college in 94, I started working on technical writing at the time for training, uh, safety training and machine operation at Nabisco. Um, and I was a project team member, a technical writer to be fair, and analyzing some of the projects, working with stakeholders. Um, I was fairly junior, of course, back then, and I somewhat accidentally got my project manager fired um, because I didn't know politics and said the wrong thing in front of other people. Nonetheless, because there's no longer project manager, I was thrusted into this sort of junior project manager role. But I did pretty well. Uh, I'm organized. Uh, I like to think through uh, issues and plan. So from there, I started managing bigger projects. And next thing you know, when I went to Accenture, I started managing very large projects, became program managers later on in my career, program director. And when I was last at the big six company, I was essentially being the largest PM on the organization. Um, applying both a combination of portfolio program and sometimes even project management. There's still stuff that I let myself. The aspirational role, as you can see, beyond portfolio, the chief project officer. I do think it's aspirational because again, I don't think the world's really need another C, but I do think that the, some level of project executive today is becoming that much more um, presence and becoming more popular. So while CPO itself may be aspirational, project executive is very, very real. So that's the first part of the presentation, covering sort of the making the objective case why you should consider moving beyond just the PMP. Um, in the next part, we'll look at really sort of the question of either or, um, or maybe even both. So this started, actually, I started putting this together a couple years ago. Um, as some of you know, my company runs the Mega Bootcamp. Uh, what Mega Bootcamp is, is simultaneously, we run a couple of major certification bootcamps at the same time. So in one room, we may have PFMP class. In another room, we have PGMP. another room, we have PMP or RMP or something. And what I started noticing is not... Um, not necessarily every time, but often enough that somebody attending a program or portfolio management class and about an hour, two hours into it, sort of come out and say, you know, team, maybe I should join the other side because I think what I do sounds more like program or portfolio, depending which side you're switching. And so we, I realized that there's actually a bit of confusion 
for people when they look beyond PMP? Um, should they really consider program management, portfolio management, or in some cases, both? So that's what we put this together. Um, the other thing I should mention is I didn't really get any questions so far, but this is can be interactive. So feel free to interrupt me or jump in with a question. Right? So I encourage you to do that. Otherwise, you'll just hear me. So let's start taking a first look at program management. This is my description now. And it deviates slightly from PMI. It's built on PMI's definition, but it's adding my flavor. Program management to me is a group of highly related projects that are managed together to gain a benefit that otherwise may not be uh, achieved if you manage them independently. The key word here and the emphasis I put is highly. Because when if it's loosely related, it actually is really looks more like a portfolio. But if it's highly related, and what do you mean by highly related to? Well, it means that the failure of a component so let's say a program have four components. The failure of one component will detrimentally affect the overall program health. That's what I meant by highly related. So it's not even just a mere dependency. It is that the benefit or the outcome of that project is essential to the overall program. Now, in that scenario, you could imagine that management are far more likely to say, we want to manage this as a program because we can't afford individual failures. And this is where program management can achieve synergy. And synergy has, by the way, a very easy definition. Synergy occurs when one plus one is more than two. The keyword is more than, right? So how much more than two is essentially the amount of synergy? If it's 2.5, you know, that's pretty impressive. That means somewhere you're gaining almost 50% of more benefits by applying this program management. Uh, synergy could be one plus one is three. Um, and of course, by the way, if it's dysfunctional and not working well, then it could be one plus one less than two, right? So this is the opposite side of synergy, dysfunctional. Um, so program management is really applying these set of tools and to deliver that substantial benefit. The way I look at it is program management is also on the top of the technical track of project management. So in that big career ladder you saw before, I consider program management top of the technical ladder, mainly because this is where the individual program manager still have to roll up his or her sleeve. They still have to be a super doer. They really are people who like to lead things, be the captain of their own ship, so to speak, have a high degree of autonomy and authority to make things happen. They deliver concrete benefits to organization. And for that reason, and they still work in all the knowledge areas in projects and programs, right? So there is a technical role. And that's why I think I view program management as that technical, um, top of the technical track. Now, portfolio management is a little bit different. Portfolio management can have an execution role too, but chances are, it's not the only thing they do, and sometimes it's not even the biggest thing they do. Um, because portfolio management is really more about helping organization make those strategic choices and determine what to invest in, and also putting together the company uh, governance, resource, and capacity to get those things done. Uh, at any time when you touch upon large investments and making resource choices for a company, you can imagine that it gets quite political, right? Almost no country, no company, no organization have unlimited resources. So the minute you apply more to one area, it probably come at a cost to something else. And those other managers aren't just going to lie around and say, great, thank you for cutting my budget in half. So it gets political. Um, this is where portfolio manager, because of the receipt, the role that they play, trying to bridge the gap between execution and strategy through governance, performance management, the management of capacity and capability. Um, that's why I see portfolio management as the top of the business ladder for project management. And if they want to go beyond project management and be their own right as a business executive, um, whether it's CPO, Chief Project Officer, or something else, Portfolio Manager is, also, is an excellent path to do that. 
know, some people may want to do both, be both the technical and business, and that's fine. But if you have a preference for more of the hands-on role, be the captain, then program management. Portfolio management is when you're really becoming sort of more like an admiral, right? You are allocating resources. You are putting out strategic direction, helping company make that investment choices. So it really moves the people toward the senior business leadership role. Um, you do have to enjoy working at the organizational level and the challenges that come with it. And that usually um, includes some form of politics as well as managing ambiguous scenarios. Portfolio manager also focus more on strategic value to an organization than let's say the more tactical, the near term value. And one of the big tough part about portfolio management is making pretty big controversial choices trade-off decisions. Because sometimes as a portfolio manager, you may decide to essentially kill some of your very own project because you need that resource or budget or even management attention on something that's more important. And of course, I'm sure those projects that's been killed aren't gonna be particularly happy. So these decisions are not easy. And that's where I see the biggest difference between program and portfolio manager. Essentially putting on your captain's hat that you wanna lead your own ship program management is excellent. But if you want to be able to command a fleet, then that's where portfolio manager come in. And by the way, people do actually go back and forth on them a little bit. Actually, in my career, I should say, at the uh, later while I was at the managing a global project services for one of the large um, professional service organization, I was actually not for a period the head of the entire uh, project, uh, the, the global PMO, so to speak. Um, playing portfolio management role, but it did get boring. Uh, it did get tiring when I started finding myself spending more and more time on politics or worrying about, you know, stakeholders' perceptions. And this is not at the project level, or program level. I actually eventually shifted myself off to work on a large program just to feel gain back the sensation that I'm still useful and, and able to, let's say, leadership versus managing a fleet. Right. So I went back and forth at some point around this upper area, demoting myself, essentially have one of my lieutenant manage the uh, global project services, for example. So that could happen to, to, to you as well. But this gives you a sense um, on the distinction between the program and portfolio management. Okay, good. We're doing pretty well on time. So in terms of qualifications, this is a fairly good side-by-side -side comparison. Um, they have very different qualifications. In program management, um, assuming you have four-year degree, if you don't, just a couple more hours, you need to have project experience about four years or 6,000 hours, and then four years and 6,000 hours of program experience. Uh, later, we'll talk a little bit about the application process, but a hint here is make sure you put enough emphasis on the project management experience on your program management application. Uh, I have seen applications in which get rejected, not for program management, but for project management. Okay. Portfolio management is different. Uh, PMI views portfolio management is essentially not even necessarily a project portfolio um, role. And by the way, in PMI literature, they don't call it project portfolio, they just call it portfolio. Uh, this is because they want to make sure the person, individual, have senior business investment decision skills. Uh, and what they actively look for are people who really have profit and loss responsibility. So a minimum of eight years in that professional space. Um, and as you can see, there is no requirement for project or program experience, but there is a requirement for having the right portfolio experience. And that's four years or 6,000 hours if you have the four-year diploma or more seven years and 10,500 hours uh, if you only have a secondary degree. This picture shows the current state of certification um, in, uh, in the PMI landscape. And as you can see, this is a little bit dated from November of 2019, so two months ago. There are about 961,000 PMPs. Right now, I think it's about 970,000. And you can see where the other numbers are. Portfolio management is still in its relative infancy. 
and it was only less than 800 people. Uh, program management, less than 3,000, but it's getting close to that number. When I became portfolio management, I was the eighth person, I think, in the world to be certified. And um, but by the way, last time I count, uh, which is maybe half a year ago, I think I was now number four, number five. So other people have retired. So I guess my joke is if I stay long enough, I may eventually become one of the top three. But these are, again, pretty early stages and you can get sort of to this bandwagon fairly early on. This picture shows you the current state of PGMP around the world. It is a little bit outdated, it is six months ago. And by the way, there's not a lot of magic to get this data. People always ask, hey, how do you get this data? Well, there is a P PMI registry. Um, so you could do enough search to pull down some of the data. The data isn't 100% accurate. Uh, meaning that if you, for example, finish your PGMP, you may not wanna be listed in the registry. So nobody really would know. But I think most people would like to be registered there, especially because for employment check. Um, so even though this is a bit outdated, this still gives you sort of the directional feel. Uh, as you can see, the uh, Americans, the United States have the most certification in PGMP, uh, surprisingly followed by China. Um, China is, I say surprisingly, because program management isn't even that popular or mature in China. And yet it is ranked number two, uh, India number three, Canada number four. But take a look at Canada later in portfolio management. They're number two. Um, and that goes back to my comment. I think sort of at a density perspective, percentage of population, they're more Canadian certified, I think, than almost any other uh, country in the world. Portfolio management, you can see Americans are still number one, Canadian two, India three, Saudi Arabia, uh, very popular, uh, number four, and even China, number five, which is interesting, um, just so you know, the exam, uh, is actually not authorized in China. For people in China to have PFMP, they have to fly to Hong Kong or Japan. Um, I know that because I spent almost a week with the Chinese officials that runs these tests. So um, what are the steps to obtaining this, this certification? Well, there are two, uh, application and the exam. The application itself can be broken down to two or three steps, depending how you look at it. Uh, it's the initial review um, submission, which is the completeness review. And then once you pass that, it goes to a panel review. There could possibly be a third step if you get audited. Um, it's so it's the uh, listed here as a sub step below the, the bullet, um, but it could be a third step for about 30% of the people. They audit roughly around 30% uh, of the application. The panel review uh, is when they then send to the experts, um, and usually they send to two experts, and if both experts agree you have the right experience, then your application accepted. Uh, if both reject, then it's rejected. If both um, one reject and one accept, then it goes to the third one as an arbiter. <clears throat> For that reason, PMI requests 30 days. Once you pass the application, you then have the examination. The examination itself, you have one year to take the test um, and hopefully pass the test. You do have the ability to take three tries. Um, from PM advisory perspective, for the most part, almost every one of us that, that comes to our program follow some resemblance of our methodology uh, completed overwhelmingly, uh, close to 100% on the first try. So let's look at some of the pitfalls from the application, then the examination, and then some suggestion we have for the exam prep, uh, and then some pros and cons on the different ways of study. So let's start with the application. And these are really um, our free advice, of whether you come to us or not, I think you should apply them because we really wanna see this field grow. Uh, the first is, if your title doesn't happen to match the certification you're pursuing, so let's say you wanna pursue the PGMP program management professional, but your title is project manager, right? Um, can you do it? Well, the answer of course is yes. PMI highly recognize that your title and your role um, can be quite different. So you could have an administrative title um, in one of the organization or one of my client organization, a team lead in that organization is equivalent to senior vice president in another organization. But team lead, frankly, isn't that sexy of a title. 
Um, so the title, yes, it matters. If your title is program manager, probably you have a slightly easier time applying for program management professional certification. But if you don't, you know, don't be discouraged. What you need to do is, of course, provide justification. Uh, clearly document your experience, explain why uh, the endeavor that you work on is a program, a bona fide program, what are the components within that program, and make a case for it. And PMI will definitely listen. Uh, one of the trick here, by the way, is if you do have overlapping projects and programs, because if you think about it in real world, especially if you work in PMO, it is actually quite possible that you are a project leader on some project, a, pro a program manager on some program, and maybe even a portfolio manager at the same time, right? That causes quite a bit of confusion on the application uh, because now you have a third party who's reading and saying, what is this person, project program or portfolio manager, or all three. So if you do find yourself in that scenario, uh, make sure you just explain it very, very clearly. Uh, it's indeed possible, PMI understands it, but unless you explain it clearly, and let's say you only put your program uh, role on it, and yet your title is, let's say, PMO manager, and you also indicate that you have worked project around the same time and maybe portfolio from a reviewer's perspective, now this becomes quite a bit of a headache to decipher everything. So if you find yourself in that situation, just make sure you have to explain it really, really clearly. Um, so that's number one. Number two, before you even work on the application, my suggestion is read the relevant standard. So for program, you should read the fourth edition of the program management standard. And for portfolio, you actually should read the third edition of the portfolio management standard, not the fourth for the sake of the test. Okay, so if you read it, then you get used to the buzzword and you can start putting that into your application. The last step here is you have to find a way to express yourself concisely. Um, both application has five essays, each essay being 500 words max. Uh, for most of us, the 500 is actually a pretty severe limitation, um, partly because projects and programs and portfolios are complicated, so it does take some words to describe. Um, you should, by the way, the flip side is you never should leave those really short, at least shorter than, let's say, 200 words. It should be meaty enough. I would say a good size essay would be 300 words up to 500 words. You cannot exceed 500. Um, but the bigger problem I think I have with most people, it's more than 500. If you are not a native English speaker, um, please look to hire or find a friend who's a negative English speaker. Because if the reviewer of the application couldn't understand what you are saying, um, they can't approve. We actually had an experience some years ago uh, helping uh, somebody from, from Middle East. And the person was very articulate in English over the phone, sent us the application. At first glance, looks fine. Every word seems to be right. As you start reading it, recognize things doesn't add up. You know, the words make sense, the sentence is okay, but the paragraph is really sort of hard to decipher. And in between the paragraphs, it's even get worse. Eventually we realized the person used something like a Google Translate. And so it translated the words fine, the sentence okay, the paragraph poor, but the entire document extremely bad. This is where you really should have hire a native English speaker. Uh, because PMO advisor, we do help clients with application review, but we really give you direction, we give you um, uh, uh, sort of thumb ups and down and pointer. We don't help you write them, uh, partly because we're not English majors ourselves, and partly because it's really time consuming and very expensive to use our resources. Um, so let me say this now and I'll say it again. While we do help our clients with application, it's not something we actively sell. Uh, we're happy if our clients don't buy from us because we typically spend a lot more time than what we're really getting paid for. So that's the application. Now let's forward, fast forward to the examination. So your applications get accepted, you're preparing for the test. Um, our advice so as you prepare for the test, these are three major, and there's of course a lot more smaller ones, and in our courses we go to a lot more detail. But the first is make sure you understand PMI standard. 
Um, this is mainly because in program and portfolio management, these terms are not necessarily commonly agreed upon. Meaning in your organization, what's a program may not be what PMI define as a program. For example, in defense industry, government industry, uh, a lot of education industry, everything's called programs. Well, they're really not program in PMI's definition, they could be projects. So here, you really want to understand the relevant standard. As I mentioned, for the program management, your job is to read the fourth edition. And for portfolio management, your job is to read the third edition, not the fourth. The reason being, is that PMI, when they developed the fourth edition, which I was on the core team, we made a lot of strategic changes. I think the portfolio management fourth edition is the first of the principle-based standards um, for portfolio management. So the third edition is a process-based standard. So that's a drastic deviation. We also made a lot of changes to the life cycle, as well as a lot of the processes, uh, or we call the performance domains. And so PMI actually had a really tough time trying to update the tests because as you can see in the PM, PFMP world, there aren't that many of us. So they couldn't statistically validate it. And also there's very expensive to do so. So for those reasons, they actually have kept the exam on the third edition, even though the fourth edition has been out for more than two years now. Uh, and to my own chagrin, since I am a core member on the fourth committee uh, fourth edition of the standard. So just keep that in mind. So that's number one, really develop yourself and gain a PMI mindset. Number two, on most of these questions, uh, especially program because it's already a principle-based standard, it is not about single right answer. It is about the most appropriate answer, the best answer to address the question. Um, portfolio management tests are very scenario driven. So what does that mean? So if you think about a multiple choice test with four tests, uh, sorry, four answers, it's very typical that there is one sort of just answer that's just wrong. It's designed for you to eliminate. Another one is right, maybe very restrictive, a uh, limited amount of time. So it's if you're good, if you're prepared, you probably should be able to eliminate that one as well. The third choice. Now, this is where they design to confuse you with the best choice. They're right probably a little bit more time, number of times or in the different scenarios, even though they're not quite the best. And then, of course, number four, the best answer. And the third and fourth usually are what most people stuck on. So you could find yourself in a scenario in which you could support either or, right? So in this test, your job isn't to find a single correct answer because in most cases, there are multiple correct answers. Just some correct answer is more limiting or restrictive or didn't address the question as appropriately. So your job is to find the best answer. Number three, given what I just said, um, as you can imagine, as you read through the question, it takes quite a bit of brain processing power. Well, that gets the problem with number three, it's time management and stress management. If you think about it, most of us who are fairly fluent in English could read about 180 to maybe 200, 220 words a minute if we're reading something casual, let's say our favorite um, novel, right? We could read pretty fast. The minute we're reading something technical, that speed drops. And depending on how fast you read, some of you probably could still read pretty fast, but most of us hovers around 100 words a minute. Well, remember, and just remember 100 words a minute for a second. The test is now 240 minutes, and there are 170 questions. If you look at a question, plus the four choices, multiple choices, and you do have to read to every one of them. Uh, as I said, you're looking for the best answer. So you can't just find the first correct answer and skip the rest because you really should read the rest. Each question plus the four answers probably have slightly more than 100 words on average. That means that if you were just reading this for the pure joy of reading, it would take you 170 minutes out of 240 minutes. Right Now, quickly you can imagine, at that point you only have a little more than an hour left. And in that hour you have to process the information, think through the ramification, select the best answer. And you could see that four hours goes away really, really quickly. 
So number three essentially says you gotta practice. I actually had a personal experience on this. Um, on 9-11, um, I think 2000, 2016, I forgot, maybe 17, uh, I went for the RMP, risk management test. Uh, I lost a relative in 9-11, so it was my way of celebrating and remembering uh, him. But as a college professor, I'm a little bit cocky. I know the stuff, I teach the stuff, I don't have to study. And frankly, I didn't have time to study either. So I showed up on the test pretty cold turkey. Um, the test is three hours, I think 120 questions for the RMP test at the time. And about halfway through the test, about 90 minutes into the test, I found myself still stuck on the first third of the question. In other words, I didn't get to the 50% mark. And of course, by that time, I'm already tired. And of course, the reason is simple. I didn't practice. So even though I know the content, I couldn't read fast enough. It took me a lot of time to process information and think through the answer. So I had to rush to the second half of the test, and I passed with the thinnest of the margin. It's actually embarrassing my score, but I did pass, and a pass is a pass, so I'm quite happy about that. So that's a lesson learned, right? So if nothing else, next time I don't have, for example, ACP, and there are times I'm thinking I should go take ACP. And I know the material pretty well. I even teach it but I probably will do a lot more practice tests and get myself ready than just show up cold turkey. So three is really time tested because all of us probably can read uh, at 200 words a minute through these materials. And by the way, you could time yourself, take your standards, count how many words, see how long it takes you to read it, and you'll give yourself a, a rating on your words per minute. So these are some of our hints. Um, other things, and we're running a little bit close to the hour, so I'm gonna go a little faster. But develop a test-taking strategy for both how you prepare for the uh, respective exam and how you plan to take the exam on the day itself. Um, very short, quickly, I think you should spend at least a minimum of 60 days. We do have clients that came up to our doorstep literally taking the test right after the boot camp. One person flew in from a different country and wanted to take the test in the United States. So went through our boot camp Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at the time we offer as a three days, um, and then took the test on Friday. So one day break in between and took the test and passed pretty well. For most of us, I think 60 days is the minimal. This is not as intense as PMBOK uh, or as the PMP. Having said that, if you don't have the experience, it can, of course, be more intense. There's quite a bit of pros and cons as you consider different modes of studying. I, I would say for people who are sort of um, uh, value their time a lot, do consider finding professional help uh, courses from PMO advisory or somebody else. If you have more time and you are a more limited budget, fully understand self-study can get you through this. The problem with self-study or any of the passive learning is you have questions you really don't have anybody to ask. So that, that's a problem. Um, the boot camps, any of the active learning uh, from us, and I'm sure there are other good, valuable um, uh, course uh, trainers out there, they can give you a lot more better answers. So there are pros and cons to each. We offer generally three different packages. I know only two here. Um, the in turn the boot camp we offer it in the traditional classroom as well as live virtual. We do record the live virtual and sell it as separately. So that's why I mentioned there could be a third format. Um, and all our tests essentially come with the full access to the exam simulator, digital material. We do do a high level application review if you want us to, but it is very high level. We just scan it to give you some obvious factor. Um, of course, dive deep takes a lot more time, and that's something we do charge. And then we also provide training uh, and support for up to a year, depending on the package that you buy. So our standard package are 30 days, 60 days, 180, and 365. And 365 are actually pretty good, because if you have your company pay for it, then you only go to company once instead of going, say, by 30 days, and then have to go back for extension. Most program and portfolio manager are very busy professionals. So you may have all your heart set out doing it in the next 30 days. Um, and we have a client that came back to our class six times before she actually passed. 
um, sorry, before she actually even took the test uh, and passed it on the first try. That's because, you know, she wanted to do it, but then she got pulled off on different projects. And again, that happened six times in that year period. We have, um, this is a little bit misnomer. We right now don't have 100%. Uh, and I need to figure out why. In December, one of the participants we have who did attain 75% or higher actually failed the PFMP exam. Um, that is the first case that ever happened. Generally speaking, we use 75 as actually a convenient number. The real number hovers around 73, meaning 70 people attaining 73% on our exam, um, in exam mode, actually almost always uh, never failed the test. But this gentleman did fail, and we're trying to figure out the reason. Um, we suspected talking to the person's supervisor, uh, because it was a company training, they told us that they were under a lot of stress because the promotion was depending on them. The other thing that we can control is the person may very well open the book when they're doing practice tests. So uh, obviously, if you for those to count, you really should have a close book to simulate the environment. But nonetheless, uh, we didn't have a chance to change this. Right now, we couldn't claim 100% until we figure out the reason. Um, but otherwise, it's very, very close. This is the only case that we had in our existence in which people who follow our method on any of our tests. And this method we use for PMP, ACP, RMP, PFMP, PGMP. Um, so we'll need to figure it out. But we do have money back guarantee and our threshold is at 85%. Um, our skin is in the game, as you can imagine. And thanks to our record, we never had to actually pay that. People always pass. Uh, again, it was one exception for something that happened in late December. Um, we also have a price matching feature. If you found a competitor that offers something as compelling as, as us or better than us, let us know. We will match it or we'll beat it. And if we fail to match it, then we'll grant you limited access to our exam simulator as a way of thanking you. Um, we do have a lot of stuff on the market, um, pre-recorded courses, exam simulator, books, LinkedIn support group. So we like to think ourselves as one of the most robust provider of PGMP and PFMP training. Here you can see our public course calendar for 2020. Uh, these courses for the most part are pretty confirmed that we are having it. Uh, I do apologize, occasionally we do have to cancel classes because as you can imagine, both of these certifications aren't the most popular uh, in the world. And generally we like to get at least a couple people in the training room. Uh, otherwise, it would be sort of one-on-one -on -one mentoring. We do have locations under uh, examination, under consideration. So if you'd like to be, let's say, in Vancouver, Seattle, please do let us know. We'll take that into consideration. Um, but for right now, those are just sites that we're considering really for the second half of the year, if not 2021. For those who join our webinar, we offer a coupon of 20% off for all our courses until the end of May 2020. So feel free to um, leverage that. Uh, actually, I should say June 2020 because we started offering some class in June as well. So feel free to use that. <coughs> These are some of our books. And because we cover the broad stroke of project program portfolio management, you can also earn PDUs. Here's the claims code, and here's the distribution of the PDUs. Are there any questions? We are right now right on the top of the hours. Okay. If not, thank you so much, everybody, for your time, and hope you have a wonderful day. Please consider us for your needs, and let us know if you have any questions. Take care, and have a wonderful day.